Legends of Media Research is a podcast series featuring interviews with the media industry's leading researchers, where we go behind the scenes, sharing stories from their greatest achievements and challenges. Brought to you by Media Science, the leader in media and advertising innovation research. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information about Media Science. But for now, I'm your host, Media Science CEO, Dr. Dwayne Varon. Hi, this is Dwayne Varon, CEO of Media Science, welcoming you to another episode of the Legends of Media Research. We're very excited today. Today, we're going to be doing an interview with Betsy Frank. Um, in the industry, if there's a key person who is the key to you getting your six degrees of separation shortened, it's Betsy Frank. Almost everybody in the industry, many of our our industry uh, legends worked for Betsy at some time in their career. At one stage, uh, when she was at MTV Research, heading up research there, she had the largest research team in the industry with uh, over 200 researchers. Um, She's a fascinating person because she's actually worked across almost every part of the industry. And uh, her, her, her career is really fascinating because She's often been at the helm at these critical moments of transition. So it should make for a lot of really exciting stories for us today. So without further ado, I welcome Betsy Frank. Betsy, welcome to our show today. Thank you, Dwayne. Great to be with you. Um, So Betsy, we're going to dive right in and we're going to start at the very beginning of your career. So Mm -hmm. you had graduated uh, as an art history major, I believe. How did you go from art history to, uh, you know, the media industry? Well, it's probably not all that unusual for the time that we're talking, talking about, because what I, what I have discovered is right now, um, young people seem to know exactly what they want to do from the time they enter college or university. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was uh, an art student. I had studied art in in high school at the High School of Music and Art, which has since transformed into a bigger high school. And uh, so I was an art major at uh, at City College of New York, and but really felt that my calling was in art history, and felt that what my career path would be was towards becoming uh, an art history professor in um, the college level. And so when I graduated, I took a couple of, uh, I started my master's at, at Hunter. And in between, I went to work. And I went to work in a completely unrelated area because, frankly, I couldn't get a job at a museum or any place where I would kind of have preferred to work. I went to work answering telephones at a company that created TV commercials not necessarily the creative end of it, but the more mechanical duplication and distribution end of television commercials. So it was, it was luck because it happened to be an area where I had access and uh, contacts with clients who were on the advertising side of the business. From that company, I was hired by Bristol Myers to work in their, uh, at that point, brand new in-house media agency, figuring out how to put together all the time that they had bought in all these network television programs on behalf of all their clients. And from there, I went to work for Ted Bates, which was a Bristol Myers agency. And after that, I kind of was pretty much on the path to working in research in the advertising business. So from Bates, uh, I went to an agency. There's so many agencies that don't exist anymore. (laughs) And I realize it when I tell these stories, you know, what? Bates? What the hell? But um, I went to work for an agency called Dancer Fitzgerald Sample, another name that doesn't exist anymore. But over the next couple of decades evolved to be Saatchi and Saatchi advertising, which I think people have heard of. And as part of the media department, as you know, the head of, of research at Saatchi and Saatchi Advertising, I became one of the founding partners of Zenith Media, which was one of the first of the so-called media dependents of, the, of that era 
in advertising. These were separate media agencies. It was kind of an acknowledgement during the, the 90s that media was important enough and complex enough and valuable enough as an asset to an agency that it should be its own separate resource, if you will. So, so I became head of research at Zenith Media. And that rather puts an end to my advertising research. Now, when, when you were in agency land, one of the ways that you uh, built your reputation was in studying the new TV shows, the new seasons as they would, as the upfronts would come up and in, in making your predictions about, uh, about the shows. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, about that part of what you were doing. I think you, you had a reputation for getting that, that right more often than not. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you did it and what your secret sauce was. Well, I, I don't know if it was a secret sauce. My, my uh, boss that I had said, uh, the secret is that you predict everything will fail and you'll be right 85% <laughs> of the time. And at the time that was, that was kind of true. But I absolutely loved that part of my, uh, my job. It was very high visibility, as you say. It was, it was going to Hollywood. It was meeting with people. It was seeing the new, what the new shows were going to look like before anybody, anybody else did. And it was, once again, this doesn't really exist in a meaningful way anymore, but there was such a thing as a TV schedule where you had, you know, the days of the week across the top and everything from eight o'clock to 11 o'clock down the side and shows kind of fit in and you kind of knew what your competition was at any given point in time. So to evaluate how a program was going to perform, both in terms of a household rating, which at the time was kind of the most important thing, but then gradually in terms of who would, was going to watch it, was it young adults, was it older adults, was it women, it was less challenging than that might be today, and certainly than that would be today, because your competition was pretty much defined. It was whatever was on the other two, or once Fox came along the other three networks. But it was uh, fascinating to be part of that, to write these reports, to predict, to try and pick a barometer that was not black and white, but had some shades of gray. And gradually, of course, as, as the, um, the television landscape, and I, again, I, I, I am advisedly saying television because that's kind of what it, what it was. It wasn't even video, it was television. Even as that became more complex with the growth of cable networks, it was still basically a television, a television landscape. And, um, you know, the cable networks delivered small ratings. They weren't available in, you know, every household in the country, the way the networks were. So they were not, they were kind of like a, just a, a fly that you swatted away. But, you know, sometimes I confess that I, I, I still have all those reports. And sometimes when I see that a show is, either going into syndication or that young people have discovered friends or something like that, or, you know, that, that uh, Seinfeld was that many years ago. I'll go back and, and find what I said about <laughs> any of these shows. I, you know, I, I really believe that television programs represent almost a time capsule of, you know, of our society and our culture and certainly the Friends and the Seinfelds are few and far between, were and continue to be, but um, it's uh, it was a different time and it was a different role, and I really loved every minute of it. But you know, at the same time, I was doing the work that an ad agency head of research had to do, which was to figure out what our clients' delivery should be, what they should buy, how to advise them, how to spend their money, work with the, the media planners. And um, it was great. And then creating, working with the, the group to create Zenith Media was extremely exciting because it was the first time I was helping to create a new business and a new type of business 
to, you know, a business that was focused specifically on, on the media practice. So yeah, I, I, I really love that part of my job. <laughs> so in a way you did end up using that art history degree. <laughs> oh, I, you know, and to tell you the truth, I think about that a lot, you know, because I, I still, you know, love art history. I love going to to museums. I love traveling when that was a thing, you know, and, and seeing so much of the art that I had studied. And I think back sometimes on two papers in particular that I wrote. I think it was one in college and one at uh, in graduate school, one about a particular cathedral and one about the image of St. Sebastian at different periods of art. And I think to some degree, a lot of this is just what I wound up doing because it's going to different places, taking not just different pieces of information, but different types of information, going down some rabbit holes to, you know, to see where something was taking you, which, which opened up other places to pursue with the goal of putting together something cohesive and putting together something cohesive is such a critical part of what any researcher, especially in this business, needs to do. Kind of as if somebody who knew nothing about the Otun Cathedral could read this paper and understand how all the pieces fit together. Well, that's kind of what a lot of our research reports and analyses had to do as well. Now, uh, at the time that you were in agency land, of course, you saw the rise of cable. Uh, You you had alluded to that earlier in the interview. Um, And I think that was another way that you developed a bit of your reputation on the agency side. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how you responded um, as you saw this this small thing, as you were saying, you know, kind of uh, evolve and emerge. Uh, It was exciting. Uh, Ted Turner was cable. Cable was Ted Turner. Um, we used to invite him over to the agency and you could see he would present in an, in a, either, if he presented in an auditorium, he was a little more, you know, on his toes. If he was presenting in somebody's office, he would be putting his cigar out in potted plants. But, but he was, you know, a unique personality. He believed in this medium. He believed in his, in, at the time, uh, TBS Superstation, TBS and, and CNN. And what I have always believed, and there were there were some really smart people, people like Kate Koplovitz at USA during this time who were, had created these new entities and wanted agencies to buy into them. And, um, you know, a lot of the agency people were like, you know, this is too small to be to to think about, too small to even think about. But Ted Turner always believed that what he was doing was producing more, was putting more television out there. And, you know, there were, there were other businesses, other networks that thought this was not television. This was something else. This was uh, cable was unique, but Turner believed that TBS would compete with the broadcast networks. CNN on a news basis would compete with broadcast news, and that in order to be accepted by agency buyers and clients, of course, it would have to be measured. So I think this is probably why the agency, and at the time it was, it, I was a uh, dancer, believed that research should lead a lot of the introduction of cable to the agency because there was certainly a, um, an awareness that if something were going to be bought, it would have to be measured. And I think he was absolutely right. And when Turner, you know, and a lot of this, you know, is probably a bit apocryphal at a certain point, but but when when Turner put at had Nielsen, Commission Nielsen, to measure, and I don't remember if TBS went first or CNN went first, but they produced an actual ratings pocket piece that was distributed to to the agencies. That was probably the most meaningful decision that could have been made in how this new medium became an accepted part of 
clients and agencies' ways of doing business. Yeah, so uh, then you did something remarkably bold. You changed, I, I don't want to say industries, but I mean, you went from the advertising side to the network side as you transitioned from from being at Zenith to going to uh, MTV Networks. Um, now, just for the benefit of our audience, at the time that you went to MTV, I, I think if you were around at the time, you know what MTV meant then. I mean, MTV was the the cool happening hip kind of like, uh, it was defining really a lot of youth culture at that, at that time. Um, and you went on to head research at MTV Networks. Um, and MTV, of course, continued growing its research team, you know, at, at, at one point reaching something like 200, being the, the largest research team in the industry. Um, so maybe you could talk first about that transition. What was it like going from being on the advertising side to suddenly being at this, uh, this wild place at MTV? <laughs> it, was, it was very wild and I was not 20 years old. Let me make that clear when, when this happened. So uh, I'm not saying I was the oldest person at, at MTV, but because you know these were all business people who'd been around for a while, but I was very aggressively courted by somebody who would not take no for an answer. And I said no a couple of times and they kept coming back. What MTV was in the process of doing, and you know, this is something that I think I've spoken to you, Dwayne, about this, that this is something that a lot of big companies, multi-brand companies wrestle with. MTV, as you say, was the, the flagship, you know, that they named the company after it. It isn't any longer, but at the time, you know, MTV was the, the lead dog. And so VH1 and Nickelodeon, which at the time were the that was those three networks were, were basically the Viacom cable networks. Viacom was just coming into the picture, but it was still an MTV centric organization. But as the other businesses started to grow, there was a sense that perhaps there were some efficiencies that could be maintained by developing some corporate organizations that were able to handle, say, HR across all the businesses or technology across all the businesses rather than have every network create its own individual infrastructure. So that's what they recruited me for, to create a centralized, if you will, and that's a dirty word, a centralized research department for this company that would be able to maintain the importance of each of these networks individually and its built their ability to reach these very, very specialized audiences, whether it was teens and young adults or you know, older adults for VH1 or kids for Nickelodeon, yet have some efficiencies of scale by, by creating a corp, someone corporate overseeing it all. So that's what I was hired to do. There were a bunch of other people who were brought in at the same time to do the same kind of job in different fields of expertise. I'm not sure that anyone else actually survived that because it was not liked by the, the people at the individual networks who wanted everything to be their own. So it was, it was challenging. Uh, of course, then I went on to do the same thing at another company, but it was, it was challenging to try and figure out how to get the advantages of something larger, having someone, and in this case, who could look across and see where there were commonalities, where there were opportunities, where there were no opportunities and, and you know, acknowledge those and yet maintain the, each client's ability to feel that they had their own. So, you know, you would never centralize creative. So the question is, is research more like creative or is research more of a, of a business function? It was a really interesting time at that company. I mean, it was already, let's see, MTV was born in 81. So this was not quite 20 years later. So still still young, you know, um, I think we had a party when they turned, when it turned 21, they had parties for everything, as you can imagine. And it was 
fascinating because at the time we had, we acquired a lot of new networks. We created brand extensions for a lot of networks. So we it were expanding aggressively internationally. So it was, you know, a fascinating time to be in the, in the cable business. There was so much changing. You know, the broadcast networks were really starting to show their lack of dominance. I mean, they were still dominant, but were starting to erode. And then suddenly this internet thing, you know, came along and all of a sudden cable wasn't the newest, shiniest object anymore. So now it was all the time that I had been kind of defending broadcast television in other parts of my career, now defending cable television in this part of my career against the AOLs of the world. So it was, um, you know, that I dare say the turn of the century was an interesting time when kind of a lot of changes were happening in the media business. And then, you know, the explosion kind of took off after that. Yeah, and that's a, another common theme we want to explore in your career because there, there are a number of times where you are tasked with grappling with the disruption. You know, something comes along and you are at the helm as you have to try to figure out how the organization is going to navigate with that inevitable question about whether you embrace or whether it's cannibalizing your audience or, you know, what is going on and how do we respond? So let's start with your time at MTV. How did you respond? <laughs> I think we erred on the side of, of being decentralized. That was a company that really did not want to be anything that smacked of corporate because centralization equals, you know, corporate. And for a while, as long as business is good, you know, you can do that. You can do that. I think as soon as, as businesses are challenged, as soon as there's, there's competition, then suddenly centralization and uh, corporate overlays don't look quite so Bad. And then it becomes a new challenge of how do I, you know, let's be frank, how do I save this company money and still make sure that, especially for a company like MTV, which really does pride itself and still does on the way it knows its audience. I mean, you know, that was, that was its thing. We know, we know our, our audience and they sure did. They, they sure did. How do we make sure we don't lose that and still get some um, efficiencies? You know, you're not going to have the same research person work on MTV and Nickelodeon, but maybe there are ways of sharing information that is less painful to the executives, especially the creative executives at each of these networks. I, you know, Maybe I'm making it sound like it was easy. I've got to tell you, Dwayne, it was not easy because, you know, did you ever pull like an animal in the direction that it doesn't <laughs> want to go? And you say, this is for your own good. We're doing this for your own. This is how you're going to survive. I have to take you to where the grass is greener, you know, and you still have. So um, it was, it was extremely challenging. As I said, I was there for, I don't know, maybe eight years, nine years. And I think I was the only one who was still, you know, other than my immediate boss, there were very few of us who were still in corporate roles by the time I left the company. And I'm not sure how they're organized now. It's not my job anymore. But it's very challenging for a company that is that built itself, especially that company which built itself on one very singular important brand, needed to grow bigger, did grow bigger. It was a company that, again, was very focused on its audience, but now it had to figure out some, some better ways of doing what it had already done um, so well. It was challenging, but it was a great place. It was a great place to be. I would imagine that the uh, digital question, the digital disruption, would, I mean, MTV was 
you know, almost dominated and known and, and Nickelodeon as well, dominated and known that youth audience, right? And so these are the people who are most rapidly embracing, you know, the internet and these new, uh, these new arenas. So I imagine the issue would have impacted you guys more than others even. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about how, how you all responded to that. How did you cope with that? You know, the well, AOLs I mean, of the there- world, what? Yeah, AOL was not necessarily, you know, a kid's uh, brand, a young people's brand. It was True. it was more of a kind of a step to whatever the world of, of the internet had to offer. I do remember some research we did at Nickelodeon that I always found fascinating because it was the kids who were on computers. The, the kids were actually, I think, leading in, in terms of internet access and internet habits. But I remember being in a focus group with kids and we asked the kids to draw their favorite, I don't think we use the word media, kids don't necessarily know that, but when you come home from school, you know, what do you do? Draw your draw your pic, draw yourself. And what I was amazed at was that most of them still drew themselves watching television, even though you know it was a time when a lot of kids were already embracing whether it was AOL or or something else. But I remember that most of the kids in the in the room, because at the time, remember what computers looked like. I mean, they were fat things with screens. And so to draw a screen could be a television, could be a computer. The way these kids differentiated was they put rabbit ears on the televisions. And this astounded me because these were kids who had never seen rabbit ears in their lives. (laughs) And I always felt it would be a fascinating research paper on the persistence of rabbit ears in, you know, in, (laughs) in the media landscape. But, you know, the businesses had started digital channels, had started subsets of the networks themselves. Nickelodeon started Noggin for for younger kids. So it was, you know, it was definitely a time when everything had broken loose and there was there was there were linear channels, there were digital channels, MTV, and I don't think uh, we were alone in this. But we, uh, but the network needed to respond to digital, meaning online businesses. So I think a lot of companies may have overreacted, and uh, we created a separate business. Don't remember if it was called MTV Online or it was something like that. And as it turned out, you know these these brands had to transcend different platforms. But at the time, we thought platform was more important than brand. I don't think I'm giving away any secrets. It was it was probably not the smartest move the company could have made. And so it was, it was a time of figuring it out. But unfortunately, companies spent a lot of money thinking they knew already what to do, that they needed to create a separate entity for online. But I think what we've learned certainly over the next couple of decades was that the the brand is the most important thing and the brand is kind of the thread that goes across all these platforms. The sense was people were going to consume digital media, especially online media, so differently that we better create a separate company and a separate business. So it became a much more challenging time to be part of of that company because there were a lot of things being pulled in in a lot of different directions. And I think at the end of the day, that company really wanted to be siloed. And I was not a siloed person. So so I went to another company and did the same exact thing. Now, from from the get go, though, when you came to MTV, you were an outsider, right? I mean, you started the job, you started the gig as an outsider. You, you you were different a lot of ways culturally, you know, from a lot of the other people there. And that's going to be another persistent feature in your career is this extent to which you were kind of like this outsider. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what that was like, what that experience was like. 
It was interesting. Yes, you're right. I was the outsider, but I was, and you'll forgive me if I say this, I was famous. I had a reputation on the agency side. I had been featured in the Sunday Times Arts and Leisure section about my crystal ball, you know, and how I knew television. And it was flattering and embarrassing and all of the above. So I came in as, as yes, um, I was an agency person. If anything, a broadcast television person came into a business that I did not know much about. I mean, you know, we, we certainly were buying it. We were, we were working with cable, but I was not born cable. And this was a company that liked people who were born cable. So it took a while. I was part of the executive team. I would be part of the big Tuesday morning meetings, you know, with Tom Preston, Judy McGrath, Herb Scannell, all the, 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 the big people from, uh, from the cable networks. And I felt like a bit like an outside. I mean, I, I was an outsider, but I felt like oh my God, what have I done? These people are, you know, they're so smart. They're so creative. They, you know, I, I may have been an art major, but I never felt that I was creative once I got into, into the business, but they were great. And they looked to me, they seemed to depend on me for answers. They may have gone off in another direction, but they, I, I never, once I was there, and once I learned the language, you know, they have their own, they have their own language. And if you didn't know what that language was, you felt, you know, it didn't help feeling this outsider feeling. But once, once I became kind of one of them, it was great. And, you know, we, then we, we were hiring a lot of people who did not come from cable, who were also outsiders. I hope I help them make the transition a little easier. Yeah, you, you've had um, a lot of amazing people work for you, Betsy, in that time. I, have, I mean, again, yes, I know. It was, we it was eight years. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, like, you know, Colleen gone, Faye Rush to, and Barry Blinn and have, Bruce Friend. We used to have conferences and I'd go to conferences. Oh, he worked for me. She worked for me. You know, they worked for me. But there was a woman who was my assistant kind of throughout my whole time at MTV and then also my whole time at, at Time Inc. And she would sometimes say, you know, he worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I forgot all about him. <laughs> yeah. So we figured it out. Now let's, let's talk about your transition. I mean, we could talk all day just about the MTV era, which was very exciting. Then you made this transition to Time Inc., a very different industry once again, a big you transition. Yeah. And may I say one other thing about, um, about sure. MTV? The networks had their upfronts, their big annual, you know, big announcements to the, to the industry. MTV decided it was going to do an upfront. And the idea that it didn't necessarily have new shows that it was introducing, but it was, you know, wanted to compete with the networks for the same dollars that advertisers were spending. So we would have this, these amazing upfronts with star power and um, research. And uh, so, you know, um, John Stewart would be delivering the research from Comedy Central. But, um, but I presented at their upfronts a couple of times and I was in their videos. I mean, so I may have felt like an outsider when I started, but the people there were incredibly warm and recognize you. If you've got talent, they will, they will take you in. Yes. So when I left MTV Networks, I was pursued by a couple of things. The one that seemed most, I don't want to say fascinating because it wasn't fascinating but it certainly feel, felt like something I had done was with Time Warner and to run the research at Time Inc which so it was and I kept saying this includes the video properties right no this is just the print brands 
So, you know, all right. So I left, I had left the agency world, gone to cable, which I knew nothing or very little about, left cable and went to print. You know, it's all about media brands. It's all about brands that have a connection with their audiences, regardless of the platform. Time Inc. was going through its own disruption, as you say. When I got there, magazines were still king. Their circulations were on the rise. Uh, People loved magazines. There was a relationship between a reader and her favorite magazine that seemed to transcend anything I had seen on the TV side. So, and it was the same kind of job. You know, they had individual silos of each magazine. Each one had its own research team or research person. And they wanted to see if there was some way to gain some uh, efficiencies and greater effectiveness by overlaying a, a corporate level. And, you know, been there, done that. And so that was my role. So I, once again, I had to learn a new medium. I had to learn the, the metrics of, of magazine measurement, certainly. I had to learn more about these brands and what they, the research that had been done, what they represented to um, people. I mean, of course, I was familiar with people and time and in style and all the other incredible timing magazines. But once again, I was inheriting uh, a pretty large um, research team at the cusp of what would prove to be a very extremely challenging disruption. Here, digital was really shaking things up, as, as you well know. So circulations began to decline, print circulations. People were reading, but they were reading online. And the economics of that, someone had to to figure this out. Could we still do all the cover tests that we did when circulation was down so low for People Magazine itself? And then mobile was coming onto the scene. And that was really exciting time to be in the business because our uh, CEO at the time, knew Stephen Jobs, and Jobs wanted time to be one of the first pieces of content on this new device called the iPad. We did some amazing research from that point for the next uh, couple of years. We had a um, uh, a lot of lab work, which I'm, I know you're familiar with. We had created a Time Warner research lab across all the divisions of the company. We couldn't have the device itself. So we had to kind of replicate what it would be like, you know, to use your finger, do you use, and what an amazing time to be in research. I mean, talk about an eye opener and an eye tracker also, because People were obviously going to be reading content differently. And so the content had to be different. So there were, um, there were a couple of years just of figuring out, well, the magazine isn't going to go away. The website isn't going to go away. But now there's also going to be a phone and a tablet. And, you know, if you have the same story, you know, Jen, Jen and... <laughs> whoever, Brad and Jen, I'm going back a ways, what goes on which uh, platform? So for a research person, it was terrific. But then clearly the economics of a company that had so much invested in the print platform, you know, could not really survive. And they tried, they tried really hard. They were going to be a, a digital first company, which I'm sure is a phrase we heard a lot of companies espouse, but it's very hard. And I saw it at MTV and I saw it at Timing. It's very hard for a company that has 
been born from us on a certain medium to move to another medium, another platform. I used to think, and I in fact, and I'm not saying that I don't anymore, that Nielsen had the toughest job in the industry because they had to make sure that the information they produced today was as good as it could be so that billions of dollars could be bought and sold today. But at the same time, they had, had to be thinking what next week's media landscape was going to look like. So it's like they had to run two companies. But it's the same thing. It's very hard for these media companies that started in one place, whether it was the the executives who ran the place as well, you know, whose heart and soul and frankly financial gain was in was in one place to move as the consumer was moving to a new place. Very challenging. Now, there was this enduring thread of a story throughout your whole career around this push to centralize, decentralize, centralize, decentralize, that constant tension. Looking back at your career, and I mean, it's still a tension, let's be real. All, all, all organizations still go through that yeah, yo-yo. Yeah. L- looking back at your career, what do you think you know you have gleaned from, from that tension? I think what I've learned is how important it is to balance the business realities of what we're doing with the goal of doing great research and coming up with great insights about the consumer. But sometimes you want to forget that there's a client um, involved, but you can never lose that balance between the business aspects of what we do and the, the research or analytic aspects of what we do. So I think the most important thing is that the research we're doing is in support of our businesses. And, you know, it's always good to know what your client would like the research to be. It may not be what the research shows, but, um, but we're doing this so that our clients can build their businesses better, especially as all of these, as media is transforming so rapidly now, it's just important to remember that we're not there just to do, you know, cool research. There's somebody who needs this research to grow their business. I think the other thing that I've learned is that research is a PR asset. Research is part of the brand of a company. It's, you know, maybe research is like a shorthand for understanding consumers. It certainly was at MTV and it certainly was at at Time Inc. And frankly, it was at, at the agency too, where I worked very closely with people from the creative department who did research for their creative productions. So I think it's important to remember that you're also part of the brand that's going into the company that you're, um, that you're working for. I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, Nielsen is undergoing new you know, I don't know if you'd call them threats, but um, new RFPs are coming out. There was a lot of issues about how well Nielsen maintained its panel during the pandemic when they couldn't go into people's houses. I saw something that I had, I don't know if I wrote it or an agency said to me, Nielsen is a lie we tell ourselves. The fact is that the research that you're doing in the media business, again, it's business research, it's research to support a business, but it's also highly critical because you we're working to create a currency. We're working to create something that will result in, you know, whether it's billions or if it's, you know, more multi-billions of dollars being traded, bought and sold. And that makes it even more important that that we think about what we do, that it's always with a business focus in mind. And, and I guess that business focus often tugs things towards the central, you know, more towards the central rather than the it, decentral. Uh, you pulse. know, I mean, it has up to this point, but, you know, again, I don't know how these companies are organized today. So Betsy, you've, you've been across a number of organizations now where this disruption came in and, you know, the the established media player had to figure out how it was going to 
respond to the new kid on the block in some ways threatening in some ways with opportunity and 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 having to grapple with what that means maybe you could tell us what you've learned you know as you look back across these different organizations with you know faced with this kind of uh, disruption you know what what have you learned from those encounters What I've learned is that the tendency among many analysts and and business people in the media is that when a new media or a new medium, a new platform, new technology comes along, the initial reaction is uh, to assume that it's a zero sum game, that it, it won't be survival across the board. It means that the new player will eventually steal audience from the existing player and that the audience will walk away gladly to embrace a new technology. And then they'll make decisions based on that because I've seen it, I've seen it happen in organizations that I've worked for. And that's really not the way it works. You know, I think it's been said that um, when we make predictions and I used to be in the prediction business, Things are either faster than we think they're going to be or slower than we think they're going to be, which again is kind of like what I think I had said to you that when you're predicting which TV shows are going to succeed or fail, all you have to do is predict that everything will fail and then you're going to be 85% correct. But the fact is that we we make decisions based on the assumption that consumers will embrace a new platform, a new technology, and will walk away from an existing one. And I think the clearest example of that that I saw was when cable, and especially the major cable networks, the Turner Networks, and USA and Lifetime came along. There was an assumption, well, dependent on which side of the, of the business you were on, that the cable networks would take audience and therefore take ad dollars away from the broadcast networks. But the broadcast networks were just as convinced that nothing would ever shake their dominance, especially in prime time. So you had these two sides and the agencies were trying to play both both sides. And again, the thinking was that these cable networks might not challenge networks in prime time, but could certainly challenge at other times of day. And more to the point, even though their individual audiences were small, these were because this was cable, cable was new, cable was still mostly an upscale purchase that households made so that the audiences that they would take would be the most desirable audiences. They might be small ratings, but they would be the most upscale, youngest audiences. And I remember this, and I've asked Dave Polchak about it. I'm not sure if he still has a copy of it, but CBS produced something called The Cable Fable that basically wanted to make sure that agencies knew all the um, the negative attributes of cable television and uh, that it was it was just nothing but a big puff puffery and uh, the broadcasts, broadcast networks available in every single home pretty much in the U.S. had it had it all. But in order to address some of this back and forth, Nielsen started to produce their share of audience reports. So you could see that the networks in certainly in prime time still had maybe 90 percent of the available audience and cable had a sliver but gradually over the years, you would see that network share start to decline and the cable share start to increase. And you could look at it for men, for women, and you would see that, again, because cable in the early years was a lot of sports, you would see that among men, cable was making pretty substantial inroads. But again, everything survived. Everything continued to in theory, improve because the competition was more fierce. And so as a result, there was more diversity of programming. And perhaps you could argue, if you were so inclined, maybe better programming all around because there was competition. So it wasn't a zero-sum game, right? So one plus one equal three. And then we saw it again when AOL and the other very early ISPs, like here's where I date everybody who who recognizes these names, you know, Prodigy and CompuServe 
came along. And I remember Marshall Cohen, who worked there at the time, saying, by the year 2000, nobody's going to be watching television. It's everything's going to be going uh, on the Internet. And of course, AOL was the gateway the, the, to, to get to the Internet at the time. And that didn't happen, by the way, because we're still watching a lot of television. So I guess the point that I would make is that more recently, you've seen these predictions for digital, you've seen them for mobile, you've seen them for streaming, that everything is going to take the place of everything else, because consumers will gravitate to the shiniest, you know, newest object. But the important thing to remember is that as long as medium stays relevant to its audience, fragmentation does certainly not automatically lead to obsolescence or disappearance. I remember having in a presentation that we used to think, and I guess in some areas it's still true, that if you build it, they will come. But here, you could build things, but if the audience was ready for it, they probably wouldn't come. But when they were ready to come, you better have it built. So it was... uh, it made more sense probably in 1995 than it, than it does now. But, you know, I think that the most important thing is that new technologies are pro- probably invariably going to be more seductive to the people who are evaluating them and not necessarily the people who they have been created for. And it's exciting to contemplate new platforms and new technologies and assume that people are going to be walking away from everything that exists. But I think until a consumer is able to see the value, it will not be a one-to-one replacement formula. And I've taken a long time to say it, Dwayne, but this is why the business world will always need research people, not just analytics people, but consumer insights people who can help the businesses understand how consumers are using these technologies. You know quite well that that a lot of the agencies have have produced um, overall use of time studies to understand, you know, exactly what people were doing. And we started to see that people will, you know, if they want to keep things in their lives, they will figure out how to do that, whether that means doing things simultaneously or um, we started to see more activity in the overnight hours. I mean, people will find ways to keep what is important to them and relevant to them in their lives. And research needs to be at the forefront of helping businesses understand that. You know, it's a great, it's a great point. Um, when you look back historically, I mean, this is not a new thing. This goes back, I mean, when movies came along, People were saying theater was dead and there right. would be no right. theater. People still go to right. go to musical theater and theater today. Um, when uh, radio came along, people said newspapers were dead. When television right. came along, people said radio would die. Uh, I mean, it's it's a consistent, uh, you know, it's a consistent thread throughout media history. You know, you think but, we've but, learned. You think we would have <laughs> learned, but it still happens. Now you made the decision at the end of your time at Time Inc., you know, you left Time Inc. kind of like retiring effectively uh, a bit early, uh, Betsy. What what drove that decision for you? You know, this push pull on how to maintain some centralized efficiencies while still making sure that every business got its specialized insights came. You know, how many times do you have to cut your budget to uh, <laughs> you know, for somebody to say? Okay, so I said, you know, I'll show you how to cut this budget. (laughs) Bye-bye. I mean, it wasn't quite that that casual. It's very very challenging. It's very challenging. I mean, I worked with some great companies at a great, great time when, when life was changing and the media landscape was changing. But to know when it's time to say, you know what, I'm not having fun anymore. I think that's important, too. You got to know when to hold them and know when to there, fold them, you know. There you go. There <laughs> you go. What would your advice be? To, I mean, there's a whole new generation of researchers out there. Most of the jobs that you've had don't even exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, notice what? that? Most of the companies what? I work for don't exist anymore. 
what what would your advice be to this you know to a new generation of researchers in the the media industries well i don't know if they're if, i i think there's a lot of data people you know there's data analytics and there's consumer insights and i'm not sure how organizations are are set up anymore i loved consumer insights I think even if you are a data person, I would say don't lose sight of the fact that every piece of data you're looking at represents a consumer. And these are people that you're trying to understand. And again, to go back to what I said earlier, it's about understanding these people in order to make somebody's business grow. Well, thanks, Betsy. What a, what a wonderful and inspiring career. Uh, again, I come back to that theme of the six degrees of separation. How many, how many legends that we'll be interviewing, you know, used to actually work with you. Um, I'm, and, and I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I mean, the ones that you've mentioned so far, those are big guys, you know, they, they but um, it's possible. It's possible <laughs> you may be interviewing some, some people who worked for me, but I remember it was always fun to be at these conferences and, and you know, have be surrounded by, do you remember me? You know, I worked for you and yeah. I think in particular, another real distinguishing feature of your career was your courage in always being willing to embrace a new challenge that was a, a completely new world, a new universe and, 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 and your ability to kind of like step into those roles, you know, in a new space uh, as an outsider and, and, and take charge and help navigate through, you know, through the challenges of the day. So, you know. I think that that's what makes it interesting. And even when, you know, the years that I was at Saatchi, I mean, you know, we could talk about some of the, the way that company changed, you know, with or that and without Saatchi's. But, you know, and there was always some new executive that I had to brief on, you know, on what we were doing. But I don't think there's anything that is that doesn't change. I mean, that must be really boring when things don't change at all. <laughs> well, so, you've embraced change, that's I'm for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks again, Betsy. Thank you so much for asking me, Dwayne. We learned a lot today about managing for change, about the constant tension between centralized and decentralized management, at least as it pertains to the research function. And I think about having the guts to take on new roles. I mean, people are often faced with a job move into a new arena where they're not sure if they have adequate command to take on the new terrain. But they can always look back at your inspiration, Betsy, and say, if Betsy can do it, I can do it. <laughs> So that's it for this episode. Thanks again, Betsy, and a big thank you to you, the audience, for joining us today. Remember to subscribe or follow this podcast, tell your friends about it, and leave us a rating or review. And if you'd like, stick around after the podcast for a quick message about media science, the leader in media innovation research. Until next time, I'm media science CEO, Dr. Dwayne Varon, thanking you for your company today. Almost every major innovation in the TV advertising industry over the course of the past decade was first tested by media science researchers. Whether you're talking about video ads on mobile phones or limited interruption ad pods or program context effects or brand integrations or pause ads or picture-in-picture -picture ads or six-second ads or interactive ad formats. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on and on. All were first tested by Media Science. Media Science is the leader in media innovation research. So when you're looking for media or advertising innovation research, collaborate with Media Science. Learn more at mediascience.com.